right, so today we're talking about testing for sleep apnea with Dr. Sahil Chopra. He's a board certified sleep physician and the co-founder and CEO of Empower Sleep. And before we jump in, if you're a doctor who wants to up-level your sleep medicine knowledge, go ahead and subscribe to this channel to keep learning about clinical sleep medicine. I'm Dr. Nish Bhopal. I'm a physician specializing in integrative psychiatry and sleep medicine, and every video is eligible for CME credits. And a quick note before we jump into the interview, I'd like to invite you to grab my free mini sleep course. It's for outpatient doctors, and it's filled with practical tips to use in your clinical practice. The link is in the video description, or you can go ahead and grab it at intrabalance.com forward slash doctors. So Dr. Sahil, thank you so much for joining me today. We've been um, chatting and uh, connected for a while, so I'm really excited to have this discussion. Oh, thank you for having me. Please call me Nish. Please call me Sahil. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sahil, so um, we connected online. We actually both did our sleep fellowship at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess, and we have a common mentor uh, who's Dr. Robert Thomas. And um, I know he's inspired both of us to kind of you know, spread the word about sleep medicine. But I'd love to hear more about why you got interested in, in pursuing sleep medicine in the first place. Yeah, it's um an interesting question. Like I so I was in the middle of my pulmonary and critical care fellowship. And it was around a time where like this fellowship was undergoing a whole bunch of restructuring. And they we were basically working like a seven day week for a six day week for nine months out of the year. And I was like super sleep deprived just from like working in the hospital ICU all the time. And around that same time, uh, we had a young family. So like, I was like super tired working at the hospital. And then I was also sleep deprived from just life that was a core responsibility. And around that same time, um, you probably have heard of his name, Wes Ely. He talks a lot about delirium. He's out of Vanderbilt. He had come and given us a talk on, uh, on one of the grand rounds on delirium in the ICU. So like that happened and like sleep is very closely tied to delirium in the ICU. Around that same, like the next year, Dr. Parthasai, he's a well-renowned palm crit sleep guy out of, uh, I think, University of Arizona. And then he came and gave a talk on like the functions of sleep and how that tied into pulmonary critical care medicine. Around that same time, like uh, Matt Walker's book was becoming very popular. And so like the interest was like developing through like the palm crit delirium side and sleep and I was like super sleep deprived so it kind of resonated with me and then I vividly remember like in palm clinic I saw a patient suspected sleep apnea we did a sleep test lost a follow-up came back again and a year had gone by and this person had like horrific hypoxic obstructive sleep apnea and I order a CPAP for him and like being ignorant, I get an email the next day from one of our clinical coordinators that, hey, this sleep test is a year old. You need to order it again. Medicare has a rule that if it's more than a year, you, it, it's not going to work anymore. And I just was like so furious and angry at the system. Like, dude, this, is, this person is hypoxic for hours at, at a time this is not a complicated problem to solve. It should not take this many months to get in. It should not take months to get a sleep test done. And I think like all of these things were happening and I was always very solution centric. And I was like, someone's got to figure this out. And, and then I think I just decided, you know, I'm going to do another sleep medicine fellowship. It seems really interesting. The system is horribly broken. And I, I went into sleep medicine with the mindset of like, how do we, provide like a seamless healthcare experience around sleep, given that it's like common to all of us, uh, starting with those who need it the most, like these people who have sleep apnea and insomnia. So that's, that's yeah. how it all started. Yeah, no, it, and it, it's so interesting how I think a, a lot of us who go into sleep medicine have had our own experiences like that, um, at least personal experiences, and then seeing patients and um, you know, for me as well, I, I think most of us were, you know, really sleep deprived during residency and 
fellowship. Sleep is not a priority for us, right? For for physician trainees. And for me, I remember one of my um, senior residents was going into a sleep medicine fellowship. And I didn't even know that was a thing back then. <laughs> I was like, oh, you can do that? So, but it's really interesting to hear your experience of just seeing how broken the system is. Um, and so I suppose, was that one of the things that prompted you to start Empower Sleep or how did, what is Empower Sleep, first of all, for people who are, oh, who are for watching sure. this? And then how did you come up with this idea? And, and um, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit too about some of the solutions that you're offering. Yeah, so and like the vision of Empower Sleep is to be able to provide patients an end-to-end sleep care solution from the comfort of their home, where a patient can sign up online, uh, receive a sleep, a home sleep test, and get connected to a virtual sleep doctor, and then get continue to get ongoing care over the course of the time that is precise and personalized for them. Whether that's a CPAP or a dental appliance for sleep apnea, or if they have insomnia and they need behavioral therapy, um, we want to we want the patients to be able to get like a magical experience of healthcare around sleep from the comfort of her, of their home. So how so? Tell me more about how that works. So if someone, let's say, um, there's a primary care physician or a psychiatrist who's seeing a patient and they suspect they have sleep apnea. What do they do next? What's the next step? Um, they can refer the patient to us. Um, the One of our um, care coordinators will run the insurance eligibility, reach out to the patient, schedule a visit, usually within a week, um, week to 10 days. And thereafter, the patient will have a, a, like a proper one-hour virtual consultation where we get a very deep understanding of what's going on. And we have a whole bunch of different educational materials that we've made with for patients around snoring, insomnia, sleep apnea. We spend a good 15, 20 minutes going through that. So they feel like they're being educated. And, and then after that, we'll go ahead and order a sleep test. They'll do multiple nights of a sleep test in the comfort of their home right now. So we're, uh, tech, we're sleep test agnostic and treatment agnostic. All we care about is the patient care. So, but for right now, we're using sleep image as our diagnostic tool or uh, watch pad. And so patients will do multiple nights of sleep testing. They can experiment to see how my sleep is influenced with alcohol. If I sleep, if I ate too late or, you know, just different things that patients may want to see. And then they'll schedule a, we'll schedule a follow-up visit usually within a week or so to run over this experiment that they did around their sleep. And then we'll come up with a plan. And if they need a CPAP, for example, if that's what the patient chooses, we have relationships with DME companies and that gets fulfilled and shipped directly to the patient's door. And then we continue to see the patient every two weeks, usually for the first three months, so that they do have a very easy, seamless process of getting acclimatized to CPAP. Or if they needed to see a dentist, for example, or an ENT, We have a a national network of dentists or ENTs that we refer the patients to so they can go see them on the ground. But then they go to that dentist or ENT having had the sleep test, having had a consultation and and, and really going there sort of like well tucked in, knowing what they're getting themselves into versus then having to still get a sleep test done through somebody else. Um, So it's been it's been really interesting um, to, to be able to see patients along this care journey and, and, and taking ownership of like the patient and the patient care and the whole patient experience and yeah. educating them along the way. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, that's, it's a really unique end to end experience. I haven't really seen that before with um, these online sleep programs. Like I've seen where, you know, people are doing home sleep testing. Usually it's one night, which isn't as effective. Maybe you can speak about that for um, picking up mild to moderate sleep apnea um, and then patients are kind of left to their own devices to figure out the next step. So it's a really unique um, solution. So could you talk more about why why three nights of testing? Yeah, you know, some people have actually done 100, 100 nights of sleep testing over a course of many, many months. But like we start off with at least three because um, so there's about three or four papers published on this looking at night to night variability in sleep. 
we all know that, but like, unfortunately, just given how insurance reimbursement has been designed, people only do a single night of sleep testing, but we all like using our Garmin or Aura or Fitbit, uh, we all know that our sleep is different with different influencers. And, but, it, but we don't have that medical grade data at scale. And if you look at the medical grade data, I think like the largest trial has looked at maybe 10,500 ish nights of testing. And what they found, and this was published in chest a couple of years ago. And what they found was like, there's a third and don't quote me, but there's about a 30% uh, misdiagnosis or a miscategorization of people who have like no sleep apnea and may have mild sleep apnea or those who have mild sleep apnea may have moderate sleep apnea. And those who have severe sleep apnea, the likelihood of them continuing to have sleep ap severe sleep apnea is, is very high. But those who have like mild sleep apnea, they can fluctuate quite a bit depending on like what body position they're in, how much REM sleep they've had. And, 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 and you're aware of this, that different events during sleep are sleep stage dependent. And the more data you have, I think the more educated of a decision um, a clinician can can make. I think that's that's really important for healthcare practitioners to recognize. So for people who are listening, because I see this a lot in my practice where a patient will, um, they may be recommended a sleep study by their primary care physician, and then they're told their home sleep test was negative. Oh, you don't have sleep apnea. And that's it, right? There's no other follow-up. There's no other discussion when they very well could have sleep apnea that's contributing to their symptoms. I'm a psychiatrist, so they may have treatment resistant depression or, you know, symptoms like that. And so for people listening, if your patient has an, uh, one negative sleep study, that doesn't mean they don't have sleep apnea. For sure. In fact, the false negative rate of a home sleep test is, fall, is far higher for people who have mild sleep apnea as compared to somebody who has severe sleep apnea. So if somebody has symptoms consistent with sleep apnea, and they have a home sleep test that is quote unquote negative. Um, it's very possible that they still have sleep apnea. And this is just a false negative study. And, the, and, and like, depending on the kind of study, I think those numbers range between, you know, 15 to 20% might be false, false negative. And the other thing that's um, really interesting is that it, it influences how we take care of this person because so I've tinkered with a CPAP. I'm, I'm like a tinker and I like playing with the different tools that we prescribe patients and getting used to CPAP is not easy. And, 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 and telling the patient that you have sleep apnea and that this is like the thing that you need to use. If it's mild and it can be managed with like a wedge and nasal dilators and side sleeping is like a far more attractive intervention than like, here's a CPAP and like, wear this for the rest of your life so we are very passionate about like personalizing a care plan for individuals depending on where they are and what their needs are and i don't like this idea of like diagnose and adios and i think like that's been the that's been that's kind of been unfortunately the model in in sleep medicine is you diagnose and you and adios and you give that script to a dme company and and like the patients get lost to follow up. Yeah, I, I love that. That's such a great point. And, and so let, let's talk a little bit more about that because as you mentioned, treatment for sleep apnea is more than just CPAP, right? And I hear all the time from, from patients and I'm sure other healthcare practitioners who are watching this hear the same thing. They're like, I don't want to wear that mask. I don't want to look like Darth Vader when I'm sleeping. Um, but there are other options available. So what are some other things that practitioners can talk to their patients about um, with regard to sleep apnea treatment? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think it like it really depends on the symptoms that the patient has, the comorbidities that the patient has, and this and like the burden of apnea, both like from like this AHI standpoint, as well as like hypoxia and like sleep fragmentation. And the different things that can be trialed. And I think the way that we sort of educate our patients is this is something that everybody would benefit from. And that's like weight loss. Um, exercising, having good sleep habits, and not operating any kind of like heavy machinery or driving a car during the day if you're if you're feeling sleepy. And then there's things that are like that are like sort of over the counter things that anybody could potentially benefit from. And those could be things like just 
practicing oral facial myofunctional therapy that promotes good posture of the tongue, breathing through the nose, nose dilators, chin straps, lip tape. I know lip taping has gotten like a whole bunch of um, traction in the last, I think, one to two years from James Nestor's book. And and I think it's it's a unique tool that can be used, but it should be done like in the right context. People who have like snoring and mild sleep apnea, we have objective data where you can see that their sleep apnea is equally as controlled with lip taping and a chin strap versus CPAP alone. But they had mild sleep apnea to begin with. This would not be applicable in severe sleep apnea. So there's all these all of these conservative things that one can try. And then like from the prescription standpoint, there is these like sort of novel devices out there that are tongue stimulators from a neuromuscular standpoint, strengthening the uh, the genoglossus, like the Excite OSA. And then you have these implanted nerve stimulators, uh, which are stimulating the tongue muscles. Um, and then you have dental appliances. And I think dental appliances are very underutilized. Um, you know, when, when we think about like, and I think this look, this gets overlooked a lot. Um, and I, I can speak for myself, but when I was a fellow, I overlooked it all the time. This idea of like craniofacial development. That if diff- that, then this explains why different ethnicities are at a higher risk of having sleep apnea versus Caucasians, for example. Like in Asians, sleep apnea is more prevalent, even if they are non-obese. When you correct for all of that, and the the shape of our faces has a big has a lot to do with the shape of our airway, and the ba- the the oral cavity, the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nasal cavity. So if the oral cavity is small. By default, the nasal cavity volumetrically becomes smaller. There's less space in the back of the throat, especially if someone has retronathia. So there's a lot of like interesting dental appliances that can be used um, by a specialized dentist that can help r- correct for some of this craniofacial hypo development that that ha- maxillary hypoplasia or retronathia that can happen. So there's a lot of dental solutions um, that that just sort of keep it simple that can really help. And we've had some really interesting cases where uh, people had moderate to moderate sleep apnea, non-hypoxic moderate sleep apnea that was corrected with palatal expansion uh, in an adult. And you can visually see like this getting better. And I think these things are very underutilized. So like when it comes to personalizing care for sleep apnea, I always tell patients, you know, there's a lot of options out there. Like let's, first put out the fire with whatever we need to do acutely. And over the course of this next few months, let's connect you and direct you to the right people where you might find another more definitive long-term solution. Right. So there's a long-winded answer. No, that was really helpful. And there's so much, there's so much that can be done, as you mentioned. And I'm glad you mentioned kind of the the anatomy of of sleep apnea because um, again, you know, this is something that people will be seeing in, in their clinics where, where you know, there are patients who have sleep apnea who don't fit the picture of the overweight male with the 17 inch neck with the loud snoring, right? It can show up in, in lots of different ways. Um, so think about sleep apnea in your thin patients, right? In your Asian population and in other populations that you might not um, associate with that classic picture of sleep apnea. And I've seen it show up in women. And um, again, as psychiatrists, you know, women will come to me with a previous diagnosis of depression, fibromyalgia, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, we'll do a sleep test. And then lo and behold, there is actually undiagnosed sleep apnea. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And you and you address it and they get they get better. And it's really interesting. And not only does like the sleep apnea perhaps get better, but their amount of like fragmentation that they're having during sleep, that starts getting better. And their overall quality of sleep gets better. And it's, it's really a life changer for them. So, okay, let's go back to empower sleep. So, so the patient will come in or you'll see them virtually. Um, They'll get a consultation. They'll get at least three nights of sleep testing. Did they ever do more than three nights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could. it's, It's so interesting. Patients are very curious to see what other things they can do that will influence their sleep in a positive way or a negative way. And, and then when we do these consultations, we're basically, we'll share our screen and our patients are actually like probably more knowledgeable than a lot of the 
you know, community that, that knows, that talks a lot about sleep because we educate them along this process and they'll see their sleep test reports with us. And it's like, Hey, you know what doc? Like, I, I think the reason like this happened on that time is because like this, I did, I tried this intervention on that day. And so we allow patients to sort of keep a journal, track their sleep and do as many nights of sleep testing as they want with the intention, like let's sort of hone down on what are other things that we can do to get you to healthier sleep. Fantastic. And so, okay, so they'll get their testing and then they'll follow up. And then you mentioned they can follow up every few weeks initially. Um, and then, so what's the process? Let's say if they need an in-lab polysomnogram, if you suspect narcolepsy or, or something like this, um, what's the process in a case like that? Yeah, we have a whole care coordination team that we, we tell the patient like, Hey, don't, I, I don't want you to do any kind of like phone calls or heavy lifting. We we're the experts at this. Our care team will take care of it. Our care team will Google like the best sleep lab in their area, make sure that, 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 that their insurance fits this picture. And then we'll send the referral out to them so that it can be scheduled. The other thing that we've started doing recently is we actually got our own level two units. Um, so level two units for your audience. So when we think about sleep testing, we have like level one PSG, which happens like in a lab. And then you have level three and level four, which are like these very primitive home sleep tests. And you have level two, which is like an in-lab study, except it's not attended by anybody. And you don't have like real-time streaming of data. It gets collected. They mail the recorder back to us. And we look at that data. And so for some patients who are, who are, you know, we think technically savvy enough to be able to put on the leads and everything, we actually have a level two unit that we can send to their home and get a very comprehensive um, set of data so that we can have a conversation with them. And we can do two nights on that too. So it's really exciting to be able to get like almost a lab grade, home, lab grade test in the comfort of your home um, without having to do anything. That's really cool. That, that's great. So what what states are are you able to see patients in? Yeah, so, and I don't think I should have done this up front, but I'm licensed in almost 45 states. And our nurse practitioners, they are all licensed in anywhere between five to 10 states. So we have 45 states covered. And um, so we can see patients from most of the states across the country if, if they need help with this. Okay. Okay, great. And then what about insurances? Do you accept most insurances? Yeah, we do. We, we do. We accept most commercial PPO plans and, and Medicare. Okay. All right. That's really great to know. So this is a great service for, um, again, people who are referring their patients for, for sleep evaluation. And you mentioned, um, I'm curious as well about insomnia, because you mentioned um, CBTI. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is the gold standard treatment for insomnia. Um, is that a service that you offer within Empower Sleep or do you refer out for that? Yeah, we're trying to figure this out um, in complete transparency. We do like, I, I sort of call it like circadian behavioral interventions. And, and, and a lot of times you'll, at least for our patient population, just by doing this sort of baby circadian behavioral intervention, patients get a lot better. Um, and if they do need to see like a mental health expert that can truly do cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, then we do refer them out. And I know there's a couple of companies like Dr. Lullaby, um, and I think a couple of others that are, that are doing this, but, but most of the time, if you address the underlying sleep disorder and you help them change their habits around sleep through a bit of sleep restriction, a down wind down routine better habits upon awakening uh it's it's really interesting how effective they can be just just keeping track through a, a paper like a pdf printed sleep diary i've heard this so many times from patients that hey dude just by keeping track of this i feel like i'm more aware and accountable and my, my sleep habits are getting better it's so interesting how that happens just like you said, keeping track and paying attention to your sleep, just giving it a little bit of, of care will actually help improve it. And I, I love the, the paper and pencil sleep diary as well. Um, and so again, for people listening, you can download the free PDF sleep diary from the AASM. 
Um, it's just a, it's a one pager. I like it a lot because it's just one grid. And then when patients fill it out, you can also see their circadian patterns as well. Yeah. So um, yeah, you can get a good sense of what's going on with them. It's, it's really interesting. And I, I sort of tell patients that like, like we're like humans, like I think all species, like all species are designed to usually like eat, breathe, have sex. And sleep is one of these things that we're like, we're, we're biologically designed to do this. It should not be effort or work or a challenge for us to, to be able to sleep. And it's, it's a biologic necessity that we are trained to do. And many times it just gets better by getting rid of the things that are disrupting sleep. And if we can just help patients identify those behaviors that they're not aware of, many times sleep has like the ability to sort of heal itself, right? Like if you have a joint injury and if it was being overused from running 10 miles every day for six months, just like taking it easy on the running, the joint has, their bodies are designed to be able to heal themselves. And sleep is one of those things too. If you get rid of some of the, it feels that way at least, like when you get, you remove some of those stressors, you help build this routine that is not that is different from like a sleep being an on off switch, but rather sleep being a transition from wakefulness to not being awake and being asleep. Um, it, a lot of things just get better on their own, unless if there is like sleep apnea or restless legs or any of these more significant problems. Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And and I I like that analogy of the on-off switch because I that's what I tell my patients is that it's sleep is not an on-off switch, it's more like a dimmer switch. And yeah. you know, and, right, and your circadian rhythm is fluctuating throughout the day. And a lot of times it's just about getting out of our own way. And like you said, removing the obstacles. The body is engineered to sleep. Our brains are engineered to sleep. Like it's it's going to sleep naturally if we allow it to. Um, and the more people try to force sleep, the harder it comes. Yeah, I know. Totally. Uh, and I think like kids are a really good example of this. Um, we have as I was mentioning multiple children at home and it, it, once you see that they're kind of dozing off and, and you turn on the TV, they'll wake up. And like, it's just, it just speaks to how having a stimulating environment around us is not a behavior conducive to sleep when there is a natural dimming of our light on off switch that is like physiologically happening and we are doing something that is causing us to then wake up again or that drives up the arousal system and it's it's and i think kids are a really good example of this because visually it's easy to observe that i think well, sometimes like i'll be feeling tired in the evening and my wife will say hey, let's watch a little bit of tv and then it's like that fatigue, that sleepiness kind of goes away because now you're sort of watching this television show and sometimes you're right. We just have to get out of our own way to just let the physiologic process happen. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, as you were talking, my dog was fast asleep right here on the floor next to me. And then he heard a noise upstairs, right? His arousal si system kicked in and he ran up the stairs. Yeah. So, yeah. So our brains are attuned, attuned to what's going on around us. Um, so... If if somebody is thinking about sending a patient to Empower Sleep, um, like who, what types of patients should they be thinking about? How do they know if they should send the patient for a referral or not? It's a good question. I, what I tell like providers, um, medical doctors, and um, dentists is, if you think that they have any kind of a sleep disorder, um, let us figure it out. Um, we're happy we can see them, test them, understand what's going on. And if they need to see, or if they need to go to an in lab, we'll go ahead and order those studies. We'll do all of the care coordination that needs to happen. And we'll do it in a very timely, efficient way. For our patients who, who for example, need a CPAP, we've built out systems so patients can be seen, tested, and on CPAP in two weeks if that's what they wanted to do, all through their insurance, which like is almost sort of unheard of in like the usual standard of care where it takes many, many months. So we have a whole care coordination team that really takes ownership and makes sure that patients get what they need. They can communicate with us via text. Um, there's a secure messaging tool that we're using and 
um, the patients are always kept in the loop of like what's what's happening with their care. So like anything that if you think that the patient has a sleep disorder, insomnia, sleep apnea, restless legs, we can take care of it. We can talk to the patient, evaluate them. And then if they need to be referred to somebody else on the ground for something more comprehensive, uh, we can do that because at least we've done the consultation. They've had the sleep test done and we have more information so that we can direct them to the right person. Okay. Needed. That's, that's really helpful. So, so more than just sleep apnea. Um, so if people are seeing, um, patients with insomnia as well, restless leg syndrome as well, um, empower sleep can help. Are there any other sleep conditions that people should be thinking of when referring patients? No, I mean, those are the two, those are like the three big things that we address. Um, but we're not equipped to take care of somebody who has like idiopathic hypersomnia or narcolepsy or any of those central disorders of uh, hypersomnolence. Um, but even if they have complex apnea, we can take care of them because we have the ability to do home titrations through sleep image. Um, we can make these changes and we can prescribe medications if required to help optimize their breathing uh, during sleep. Can you share more for people who are listening, if they don't know what complex sleep apnea is, can you share a little bit about what that is, what that might look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if we think about like, I think what's, what's happened um, historically is, and I think in medicine, we like to do this just for ease of understanding is either you, from the pathophysiologic standpoint, we think of sleep apnea as okay, the complete cessation or reduction in breathing, obstructive sleep apnea, if, if that cessation of breathing is because of an obstructive process in the airway from anywhere from the nose to the upper airway. And on the other end of the spectrum is you have central sleep apnea where, you know, the way I used to think about it is like the brain forgets to remind the body to breathe. But then you have patients that are sort of in between this and complex sleep apnea basically refers to the inability of the body to regulate carbon dioxide in a efficient way and like the analogy that that comes to mind is that of a of a thermostat for example and uh, so let me take a step back so breathing is regulated more by carbon dioxide than it is by oxygen i think that's the first thing to understand that that for one to stimulate like the response of breathing there has to be a very substantial drop in oxygenation but a very subtle rise in carbon dioxide can make somebody more short of so co2 is regulated more narrowly than oxygen is and the so like the thermostat of co2 being uh if if i uh, hyperventilate very quickly i'll drop my carbon dioxide level to a point where then my body will feel like i don't need to breathe or Vice versa, if I hold my breath, and divers do this all the time when they go underwater drive, under deep sea diving, or if I hold my breath for too long, um, CO2 levels will, will rise to a point where I will make it hard for me not to breathe. So I'll have to breathe very quickly. So people who have complex apnea, their ability to sense carbon dioxide is a little dysregulated. And complex apnea refers to a form of sleep apnea where CO2 regulation is not the way that it should be, and it's more um, narrowly regulated, and any fluctuation in carbon dioxide can make their breathing unstable. They may hyperventilate or hypoventilate very easily, depending on what's happening to carbon dioxide levels. Yeah, and so that's that's really great that you guys can manage complex sleep apnea. Um, and sorry if you hear that noise in the background, that's my dog <laughs> squeaking his toy. Um, but what we will find is for patients who have complex apnea, um, and again, for people who are listening, they really struggle with using CPAP, right? And they they say that they feel like they can't breathe with their CPAP on or they're fighting against it. And then oftentimes these patients will give up on treatment and then they'll just, you know, not get any treatment after that. Um, so identifying and, and treating complex sleep apnea can really be life-changing for people. Um, and so could you share a bit about, so if you're seeing complex apnea in your patients, um, how, how might you manage that? And um, uh, I, I think people will be interested as well to hear about the data you were sharing before we started recording some of the data that, that you're looking at and um, how you're kind of tracking patients long-term. 
Yeah, I know for sure. Um, the way that we're, so about a third of patients have some degree of quote unquote high loop gain or complex apnea. Loop gain would be just referring, it's just a mathematical term that refers to um, the ability to, it's a feedback mechanism for carbon dioxide uh, regulation. And about a third of people um, have some degree of intolerance to CPAP because the CPAP, the positive airway pressure may cause their CO2 levels to drop below a point where they, they may have the sense of asphyxiation. And we see that manifest in the form of like central apneas that can happen on CPAP. And there's a lot of different ways to, to manage that. One is complex apnea is always worse on their back. It's less worse on the side. The second thing is we can manage it with um, a medication that a lot of us are familiar with called acetazolamide. It's used for high altitude pulmonary edema, high altitude cerebral edema, and it changes the sensitivity of carbon dioxide. So we can use Diamox for that. And the other third thing that we use a lot is um, dead space, uh, helping people rebreathe some of their carbon dioxide during the night. And the, the, the amazing thing is that we can do this all with the patient being in the comfort of their home. So these medications and things can be prescribed to them. They get shipped to their home. And then we can continue to track how their sleep is doing um, through home sleep testing, which, and then home sleep testing being distilled down to like just a ring. And, it, and it's really interesting to see how someone's sleep evolves with different interventions, both objectively and subjectively. Yeah, and then if, well, someone, if someone needed like an in-lab titration study with ASV or something, with ASV being a different form of mechanical ventilation at night, um, we would refer them. We would have that titration study done and we would try to take care of this person as, as long as we can. Great. No, it's it's really exciting to to kind of see to see you guys doing this at Empower Sleep because, you know, as I mentioned, we both did our training at um, Beth Israel Deaconess for sleep medicine fellowships under Dr. Robert Thomas, who was researching all this stuff. And he was doing these really unique treatments and combinations of things like you were just talking about the Diamox with oral appliance and maybe even combination with PAP therapy. So to see this kind of coming to life at scale where patients beyond the lab in, in Boston can experience the benefits of these treatments is is really, really cool. Um, and so I'm I'm really grateful that you started this company because I have patients to to send to you. Um, yeah. If people, if people want to learn more, um, how can they find you? What's your website? Um, and how can they get in touch with you if they'd like to understand more about what you're doing? Yeah, um, you can go to, um, I, I, before I say that, I, I, like, like what I've always shared with people, like what we're trying to do at Empower Sleep is build the Harvard Sleep Division online. Like I, I want us to be able to take care of like the most complicated people using a virtual first approach and, and be, and like bring the most up-to-date science, sleep science directly to the patient. Like I, I, historically what's happened in like these digital healthcare companies, like if you take, um, I don't want to take any names, but like they're, they're solving, you know, hair loss, erectile dysfunction, skincare stuff, like things that are, they can be complicated, but they're not as, they're pursuing, getting people generic medications online in a seamless asynchronous way. And what we want to be doing is be taking care of like complex problems online in a, in a very seamless magical way. And, and, and the only way we can do that is if we have like world-class clinicians, nurse practitioners, and, and we strive to build the Harvard sleep division online in the process of, of, of doing that. And if, if any of your patients want to have that kind of, care you can just send them to uh, empowersleep.com and one of their personalized care coordinators will take care of them and direct them and make sure they get seen in a very timely fashion well wonderful so we'll put those links on the screen and we'll put them in the video description as well and uh yeah thank you so much for joining me today for this video this really was a master class in treatment of sleep apnea so um thanks again for sharing your time and knowledge no, it's been a pleasure. And like being, uh, having come from the, I feel like we're two peas from the same pod <laughs> we're trained by this, by the trained by the same people. And it's always exciting to connect with alumni and people that are also doing really amazing things. Um, 
the, like the connection between mental health and sleep is probably one of the highest. Uh, you know, I always talk about these, this, like this idea of like pillars of health. And like, you're basically covering like two pillars of health by yourself through like what you're doing. And I think that's amazing. And I commend you on, on taking that initiative, being a clinician and trying to build a company or solve a problem is really hard because we come from such a place of comfort. It's so easy to just go to Sutter or Kaiser and, you know, get a decent job. And it, just, it requires a very high level of commitment and authenticity and just like a desire to solve a problem. So I'm like really inspired by people like you and other people that you've like, you know, restful sleep, Dr. Funky, for example, people that are like trying to solve this problem of that sleep healthcare should be easy, easily accessible. They should have the right information. And, um, and I just want to support you guys and whatever you guys are doing to help the population. Oh, well, that, that's so kind of you to say, and that's so meaningful to hear. And, and you mentioned Dr. Funke Afalabi Brown. Um, she's at Restful Sleep MD. So for anyone listening, she's amazing. And she talks about women's sleep health and children's sleep health. Uh, so I'll put her link in, in the video description as well. But yeah, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about physician entrepreneurship, because I think that as physicians, we make the best entrepreneurs, uh, just because of the nature of our work is solving problems for people. And I think we also have a responsibility as healthcare practitioners to provide a credible voice out there. Um, there's a lot of misinformation these days. And I think we do have a responsibility to share our knowledge and, and help people on a larger scale. But No, absolutely. Um, and thanks again for, for coming on today. I'm, I'm really grateful. And yeah, I mean, I think we could keep on talking. So maybe we'll schedule another video <laughs> and, and go into some of these other aspects as well. But um, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for having me. If you're a doctor who wants to up-level your sleep medicine knowledge, go ahead and subscribe to this channel to keep learning about clinical sleep medicine. I'm Dr. Nish Gopal. I'm a physician specializing in integrative psychiatry and sleep medicine, and every video is eligible for CME credit.